and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to call this a reflection as opposed to a sermon. If a, a sermon is the kind of thing where you take a theme and try to wrap it up, or at least try to wrap it up in some coherent package, Good Friday doesn't really lend itself to that. It's intended to end with questions. And that's certainly what happened to the original disciples after Jesus died. All was lost. So, two reflections. The first is that the manner of Jesus' death is the message of the gospel. Let me say that again. The manner of Jesus' death is, in fact, the gospel, the message. All four gospels, in all four of them, the passion and death of Jesus are center stage. Mark, in fact, doesn't even include resurrection appearances, assuming that we accept what is almost universally accepted in the scholarly world, that verses 9 through 20 in chapter 16 of Mark are very late additions that don't belong in that gospel. Then Mark ends his gospel with an empty tomb, but no appearances. It's the passion and death of Jesus that occupy center stage, take up the most ink. The converts to Christianity, they were not drawn to the Christian faith because it offered some sort of new spirituality or a new moral code, but because of the explosive message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul, of course, has a lot to say about the crucifixion. And let's not forget Peter. His first sermon in Acts chapter 2, he makes it very clear that Jesus was crucified as the culmination of God's preordained plan. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians and again in Galatians, makes it absolutely clear clear. There's just no doubt what in his mind is in fact the content of the gospel. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And in the second chapter, when I came to you brothers and sisters, I did not come preaching God's secrets to you like I was an expert in speech or wisdom. I had made up my mind not to think about anything while I was with you except Jesus Christ and to preach him as crucified. And in Galatians, for the meaning of Jesus' death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. And as for me, I, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to be clear that it's not that Jesus died but the manner of his death that is the content of apostolic preaching. There was an article in the, the Globe newspaper earlier this week that as I read it uh, in disbelief, it captured, at least in my mind, that aspect of sin that I was talking about last Sunday the biblical teaching that sin is both this dark power and human willful rebellion. Remember, in Luke's passion, at the time of his arrest, Jesus says to his captors, this is your hour and the power of darkness. So this article, this article was about a, Boston gentleman by the name of Nick Memo, who was arrested for keeping a TV he didn't order. Now, that, the, the headline read pretty much that way, for keeping a TV he didn't order, but as I read the article, what in fact happened 
was that he was mistakenly, a, a, a television was mistakenly delivered to him along with the one that he had ordered, and he kept it, and then lied to the police about the circumstances in which he, he kept it. And as I read the article, I think that genuinely, he, he genuinely was bewildered and baffled about what he had done wrong. Now, the thing is, is that that's the power of sin at work. The power of sin shrouds the human heart so that we become blind. We can't even see right from wrong. That very same power was on display in John's passion when we all said together, we have no king but Caesar. Wow. Because that's an extraordinary thing for Jews to say. Because throughout their history, God was their king. They're so caught up by the power of sin that they reject their own God and declare that Caesar is their only king. The power of sin is broken on the cross. It's perhaps easier to see that because the resurrection demonstrates that the power of sin is broken. Paul in Romans said that the wages of sin is death. And so we might just paraphrase that to say that perhaps the, a, a symptom of the dark power of sin is death. And Jesus rose from the dead, therefore death is defeated, therefore the power of sin is defeated. But what about the willful human rebellion part? Because that was the interesting thing about this, this article in the Globe. Because as he mentioned how bewildered he was over what he had done wrong, the police and others, as they tried to shed light on the darkness of his heart, that is to say his inability to see the right from wrong, he responded with willfulness and rebellion and lied. The power of sin and human rebellion all wrapped up in one story, true story at that. What is it about the death of Jesus that broke this power of rebellion, or perhaps put it another way, how does the death of Jesus take care of our willfulness and our rebellion? It's a complicated question that I really can't give justice to in a sermon. That's kind of a play on words, by the way, because the bottom line here is what's going on in the cross is we're, we're seeing the justice of God at work. Here's a question to think about. Can there be forgiveness without justice? Can there be forgiveness without justice? The most difficult and memorable funeral that I ever presided over was in my last congregation at the funeral of Ruby and Milton McClendon who were murdered. The news trucks were there, and it was, a, it was also a very, very big funeral. And afterwards, their family was in front of all the cameras, and the lights were shining on them, and one of the sons had obviously been picked as the spokesperson. I couldn't hear it at the time, but later I saw in the news that what he said was, I forgive the people who murdered my parents. And I have to confess to you that I, I, I have no doubt that he genuinely was trying to 
to live into Jesus' command to forgive, but there was a certain hollowness and emptiness to it because the cat people hadn't even been caught yet. And how can there be forgiveness without justice? How does that possibly work? Fleming Rutledge wrote, Forgiveness in and of itself is not the essence of Christianity, though many believe it to be. Forgiveness must be understood in its relationship to justice if the Christian gospel is to be allowed its full scope. And that reminds me of Desmond Tutu, the archbishop, the, the one-time archbishop of South Africa, intimately familiar with injustice. He said once that forgiveness is not cheap, it is costly. Reconciliation is not an easy option. It costs God the death of his son. So consider your own struggles with forgiveness and reconciliation. Consider how we are, we very easily take the slights that have come our way, big, big and small, and we use them as an excuse to harbor resentment and bitterness. And we want to say to ourselves that we're justified in withholding forgiveness. At some level, what is going on there is the sense of justice needs to be done. Something needs to happen before I can forgive. Now magnify that by infinity because all of the human willfulness and rebellion that came before the death of Jesus and all of the human willfulness and rebellion that would ever come afterwards are heaped on Jesus on the cross. And God's justice is revealed. So it's the manner of Jesus' death that is the message. The second thing is, I submit to you that the cross is, to quote Fleming Rutledge, is irreligious, and that, that means, of course, that it's not a religious symbol. Now, that, I'm sure, strikes you as odd, because it's, we're so familiar with the cross, it's so ubiquitous, that to imagine it being anything other than a religious symbol is probably next to impossible. But in your handout, I've given you a picture of a crude stick figure drawing that scholars kind of de debate how old it is. Some date it to the latter part of the first century, others date it to sometime in the third century. In any case, the point of this to show you this is to say that for a long time after Jesus' death, the cross was by no means accepted as a religious symbol. I dare say to every man and woman, Jew and Greek alike, what we see in this picture is the what people thought about those who were crucified. You know that, that phrase, you can't make this stuff up? Yeah, I imagine at a dinner table, a Jewish dinner table or a Greek dinner table, doesn't matter. <laughs> a conversation go, ensuing something like this. Have you heard about these wackos out there who are worshiping some jackass who was crucified? You can't make this stuff up. That's what people would have thought. The cross was not a religious symbol, and it really leaves us with a haunting question. Why would anyone pick that as the symbol, 
the centerpiece for a religion that you would want anyone to take seriously? That's a question you need to ponder. Christianity is alone among the world religions to have as its focal center the anguish and debasement of God. Don't tell me all religions are the same. They're not. And we, of all the religions in the world, have as our symbol the most irreligious religious symbol. And those are the things I invite you to reflect on between now and Easter. The manner of death is the message. And the cross is anything but a religious symbol. Amen.